Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs and this is my initial review of the Canon RF 24mm 1.4L VCM, a high-end, wide-angle prime lens designed for EOS R mirrorless cameras and corrected for full-frame sensors. I spent some time with an early shooting sample for this review. Announced in October 2024 and costing around £1,800, dollar price linked in description, it becomes the second native 24 in the RF catalogue, a higher-end model that's not only a member of Canon's L series, but also part of a growing number of hybrid lenses that are optimised for both photo and video. In Canon's world, a hybrid prime lens means having a de-clicked aperture ring, minimal focus breathing and fast smooth focusing, but also a unified size and design first seen with the RF35 1.4L VCM just a few months earlier. But don't worry if you're only into taking photos and don't care about video, just think of it as their latest and greatest 24 1.4L. Now the price may be similar to the RF35 1.4L, but this still makes it one of the most expensive 24 1.4 primes from any mainstream manufacturer. For example, Sony's admittedly older 24 1.4 G Master costs around $1400 or pounds, while Sigma's 24 1.4 DGDN Art is only around $800 or pounds. But of course, neither are available in the native RF mount, so if you want a high-end 24 prime for a Canon EOS R body without adapting an older EF model, this is going to be the lens for you. To illustrate where Canon's going with their hybrid series, here's the RF35 1.4L in the middle, flanked by the new RF24 1.4L on the left, and the equally new RF50 1.4L on the right, which was launched alongside it. I've got a separate video on the 50 if you're interested, not to mention the new RF70-200 2.8 zoom. So in total, this now makes two hybrid zooms and three hybrid primes to date. The three primes share the same size, design, controls and aperture, with only their labels and lens hoods to tell them apart. Even their weights are only a few grams different. Compared to the old EF24 1.4L Mark II, which it essentially replaces, the new lens is a little bit narrower, a little bit longer, and almost 100 grams lighter, but essentially similar in physical size and heft. To further cement the design strategy, here's the RF24 1.4L on an EOS R5 Mark II, now swapped for the RF35 1.4L, and finally here's the RF50 1.4L. And now let's see them with their hoods mounted, starting with the 24, followed by the 35, and now the 50. But beware, with the same mounting for the hoods, you better not mix them up. In terms of controls, the RF24 1.4L is exactly the same as the 35 before it, so starts with a permanently declicked aperture ring nearest the mount. This turns smoothly and quietly, and is designed for discrete adjustments while filming video, or just set it to the lockable A position for traditional body-based control. But for photos, it's a thornier issue. First, unlike Sony, Sigma, and now Fujifilm, there's no option to set it to clicked operation. Secondly, pre-2024 bodies won't even recognise the aperture ring when shooting photos. Now, it'll work just fine when filming video on any body, but the only ones that can use that ring for photos, at the time I made this review anyway, are the R5 II and R1, although we can collectively cross our fingers for firmware updates on at least some key older bodies. Now, Canon's explanation is since the launch of EOS in the late 80s, their aperture has always been controlled by a dial on the body, such as the rear wheel seen here on the R5 II. Plus, on higher-end RF lenses with a control ring, like this one, you can always assign this operation to barrel-based adjustment if you prefer. You can see it adjusting the aperture on the R5 II and with positive clicks too, but it still annoys me that the dedicated aperture ring on these hybrid lenses could end up being dormant for any owners, and remain declicked even for those that can use it, but it is what it is. So moving on, between the aperture and focusing rings are a switch for auto manual focus, a custom button normally assigned for focus hold, and a spring loaded switch which again lets you lock the aperture ring to A for body based control. Alongside this is the free spinning manual focusing ring, which like most mirrorless lenses is motor assisted, but at least turns very smoothly here. And finally, the customizable and clicky RF control ring at the end, which again can be assigned to controlling the aperture if you're missing a clicky adjustment from the barrel. At the end is a 67 mil filter thread, again shared across all three hybrid primes so far, and a bayonet for the hood as seen earlier, although again, beware not to mix it up with the other primes, or on this one, you're gonna suffer from vignetting. Like all L lenses, there's a metal mount and dust and moisture resistance, including a rubber grommet. Unlike the earlier RF24 1.8, there's no optical stabilization on this model, so to eliminate the shakes, you're gonna need body-based stabilization or a fast enough shutter. 
Focusing is taken care of by a combination of a Nano USM and a Voice Coil Motor, or VCM for short, with the latter allowing faster movement of larger lens elements. You can see it in action here on the R5 II, swiftly refocusing for stills. If you prefer a more leisurely focus pull, here's how it can look for video, again filmed using the R5 II. As it pulls focus, also notice how there's virtually no breathing to speak of, and this is being achieved optically without any digital compensation here. Turning to a mostly human subject, here's how it looks tracking me across the frame again with the lens wide open at 1.4. As I move back and forth, you can not only see the minimal focus breathing, but also the potential for background blur at this kind of distance. Now, 24 lenses are ideal for environmental portraits or presentations where you can see more of the surroundings, but still here with some nice separation. Moving on to stills, here's my distant landscape scene, angled as always so that details run into the corners. This was taken on the R5 II with the lens open to f1.4. Now this lens was nearly sample, but I'm told it is reflective of the quality you can expect. Taking a closer look in the middle reveals very fine details right out of the gate, although closing the aperture one stop to f2 will improve the contrast. There's little to be gained in sharpness by closing it any further though. Returning to the f1.4 sample, and now heading into the far corner, again shows it to be very well behaved in terms of detail and sharpness, with only some darkening due to vignetting to mention. Closing the aperture one stop to f2 lifts that darkening, and as seen before also improves the contrast, but again this is the lens performing very close to its maximum here. How about a portrait? Here I am again taken with the R5 II and the lens wide open at 1.4, where there's very crisp details on the focused areas and attractive rendering in the background. As seen here and in the previous clip, it's clear how the lens avoids busy bokeh, which can often be an issue on wider focal lengths. For a more detailed look at bokeh and rendering, here's my close-up ornament test, shot from the minimum focusing distance, which for this lens is 24 centimeters. With the aperture wide open, you can see nice well-behaved bokeh blobs with minimal outlining or textures. Like most large aperture lenses, there is some elongation to those blobs towards the corners, but overall, it's an attractive looking result. At f2, they've almost all become more rounded and uniform while avoiding the shape of the 11 blade diaphragm system. This continues at f4 onwards with the blobs becoming more rounded, more uniform across the frame, and still managing to avoid giving away the shape of the diaphragm system. And until I get to spend more time with an absolute final production sample, that's all I can say for now. But I am going to leave you with a few more sample images while wrapping up. The RF24 1.4L VCM looks like an excellent quality, high-end, wide-angle prime lens that will satisfy demanding photo and video shooters, even if Canon's approach to the aperture ring remains restricted. Sure, it's not cheap, but the spec and performance are undoubtedly high, and anyone on a tighter budget could alternatively go for the RF24 1.8, which is smaller and includes optical stabilization or indeed adapt to used EF24 1.4 Mark II, or how about an older Sigma Prime in the EF mount? Any of these lenses could cost as little as one third the price of the new RF24 1.4L, which also illustrates how there is a gap for a new model in between which Sigma could easily fill with their DGDN art model, at least given the chance to do so. Which only now leaves me to ask you what you think in the comments, and as always, to thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye bye.